Luke chapter 2. We're going to start our study here this morning. So I hope everybody got the PDF <clears throat> that I sent out this morning. Um, if you want to you open that and, and, um, and just kind of follow along with, uh, with the PDF, that'd be awesome. And it's kind of in a, in a, in a packet of studies that, um, that we call Good News 101. And it's basically based on the three kind of amazing gifts of God that he gives us through the good news that we see in Acts chapter two. It's, it's Jesus and reconciliation and community. And, uh, and so one of the studies that, we, that, we, that we've just been, that we think is awesome is the coming of the kingdom study because it really kind of puts in context the community that God has enabled us to be a part of. And it really puts in context how God has really worked for our good over, not just over the span of a few years, but over the span of really of eternity and of the history of, of mankind. And it's, it's a kingdom that's not going to be forced on us. It's a kingdom, it's a community of love that we have to choose and that we have to embrace and that we have to, to um, seek first in our lives to, to really enjoy the benefits of it. And so God doesn't enforce it on us. God, God uh, provides it for us uh, generously and, uh, and, and enables us to take hold of it. And so we're going to start here in Luke chapter 2 in verse 10 because, because God has been doing a lot through the, through the history of man up until Luke chapter 2. And we'll talk about that here in just a moment. But, um, but God comes and kind of breaks in to the, to, to the history of humankind in Luke chapter 2 with an awesome announcement about something that he's going to do that he's actually been referring to for, for many, many years before this. In Luke chapter 2 and verse 8, it says, And there were shepherds living out in fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will, be, you will find a baby wrapped in clothes and living and in, um, in lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. The angels came from God and said, I've got some really awesome news. It's about peace. It's about goodness. It's about something that God is giving to humanity, even though really in so many ways, we don't deserve it. We don't deserve God's grace. We don't deserve God's mercy, his love, his providence, but God wants to give it to us generously. And so the angels come and they announce the good news, the coming of the Messiah, the coming of the King, who would be the, the faithful and righteous and loving and graceful leader and a provider uh, for the kingdom, the kingdom of God. And so, uh, you know, in this study, you're going to see God's love and generosity in giving us his kingdom and the continuity of the Old and the New Testaments. It's really cool through this, through this study because we get a chance to see God working throughout history and God working through visions and prophecy and then specifically coming through on those on those visions and on those on those uh, prophecies specific, specifically for us, you know, I want to I want you to ask yourself what what do you think the kingdom of God is? And maybe that's a question for before we came, became a little bit more familiar with the kingdom of God. I know for me, I thought of the kingdom of God as heaven, you know, and I thought of maybe that that heaven was sort of the the, the kingdom that that the coming of the kingdom would be, you know, um, maybe the return of Christ or you know, heaven itself or something like that. And it was really kind of interesting to me to, to see what the kingdom is actually from, from God's word. Um, when did God give us his kingdom? And why did he give us his kingdom? These are important questions for us to understand, you know, um, what God is doing and the incredible blessing that the kingdom is. I think sometimes we can kind of look past it and we can kind of get overly familiar with it. 
but the kingdom is extraordinary. The kingdom is an expression of God's heart. The kingdom is an expression of God's care and love for, for his kids and for his people. You know, in the beginning, God gave us a garden. God created the garden, and it was this place of, of protection. It was this place of abundance where all of our basic needs were met, and God was pleased to meet our basic needs. You know, in the garden, there was meaningful work that we give our hearts to. We could work the garden. There was meaningful relationships. God said, it's not good for man to be alone, and so he gave us, he gave us one another. Uh, he gave us meaningful relationships. He gave us wisdom that we didn't have to kind of go it alone. He was with us and he was going to walk with us and give us the wisdom that we needed to meet, to, needed to, to, to live and to thrive. He gave us freedom. He said, you're free to work the garden. And uh, it's crazy because, you know, in that, so in, in that situation, we rejected God and we thought we knew better. And so we ate from the tree of we know better because we started to run after the shiny stuff. And we started to run after this kind of the desire for us to be God and not for God to be God. And so we've been reaping the consequences of that ever since. You know, it's kind of crazy because then God gave us priests and prophets to lead us back to him and to lead us back to his way. And, and uh, he put God, God set himself as king over us. And he gave us messengers. He gave us priests and prophets to help us to, to guide us back to him and to, and, and to guide us back to God as, as king, actually, and practically in our lives. But we rejected that too. Look over in 1 Samuel chapter 8. 1 Samuel chapter 8. Samuel chapter 8. God has really been trying to work in the, in the hearts and the lives of his people. But something crazy happens here in 1 Samuel 8. Something, something uh, world-changing. Um, and it was, it, it's sad, actually, what happens here in 1 Samuel 8, because what happens is, is the people want a worldly king that's going to be impressive to them. That's good, that the other nations have, and they reject God as their king. They say, God, we don't want you as our king. You're not enough. God, you're not, you, you're not strong enough. You're not powerful enough. You're, you're not enough. We want a worldly king who can really be impressive to us, who can be sort of our, who can go out and fight on our behalf. And so it's kind of crazy because in, in 1 Samuel chapter 8, it says, in verse 1, it says, when Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as judges for Israel. The name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second was Abijah, and they served at Beersheba. But his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. Why is that so often the case? Is that we, 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 we walk away from God. We think our way is better. And, uh, and we don't walk with the, with, with the God, our almighty God who created heaven and earth. What an honor. What, a, what an incredible what an incredible opportunity, but so often we walk away from that. And so in verse four, it says, so all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. And they said to him, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. But when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. And so he prayed to the Lord and the Lord told him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you that they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt and until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Now listen to them and warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over you will do. Now listen to this, you guys, because it's such, it's such a, a foreshadowing of worldly leadership and worldly empires and worldly kings. Listen to this in verse 10. It says, Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking for a king. He said, this is what the king who will reign over you will do. He will take. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses, and they will run in front of his chariots. Some he will assign to be commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and commanders and others to plow his ground and reap his harvest and still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. 
he will take. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and your, vine and your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants, your men ser for servants and maid servants and the best of your cattle and the donkeys. He will take for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will become his slaves. And when that day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen. And the Lord will not answer you in that day. Makes me want to cry. Because, because we oftentimes wish on ourselves harm and wish on ourselves things that are very unwise. And we walk away from the provider, from the generous one, from the almighty God, who isn't a taker. He's a giver for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him won't perish, but have eternal life. God is a giver. God doesn't need anything. He just wants to have a relationship with us. That's abundant and flourishing and thriving. So in verse 19, it says, but the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, almost like little kids are throwing a tantrum. They said, no, they said, we want a king over us, exclamation point. Then we will be like all the other nations with a king to lead us and, and go out before us and fight our battles. And when Samuel heard all that the people said, he, he uh, <clears throat> prepared it. He um, repeated it before the Lord. The Lord answered, I listen to them. Listen to them and give them a king. And then Samuel said to the men of Israel, everyone go back to his town. And there is a Benjamite, a man of standing, whose name was Kish, son of Abiel, the son of Zenor, the son of uh, uh, Becherath, the son of Af 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 Afia the Benjamin, of Benjamin. He had a son named Saul, an impressive young man without equal among the Israelites, a head taller than any of the others. And so it goes into the story of Saul. So along comes Saul, who was impressive, but he was incredibly insecure. He, was, he wasn't a godly man, but he was impressive on the outside. He was handsome. He was tall. He was powerful in a human way. And so people were like, oh yeah, that's our guy. Let's have him be king. And then came, but he did it, but he did a terrible job. And, and everything that God had just said would happen, happened. And he took from them. And he led with insecurity, not with faith, hope, and love. And, and they reaped what they sowed. They reaped the consequences of this desire. And so then came David, and then came Solomon, Solomon. And the rest is history, because we as humans like to drive ourselves into the ground because we want someone worldly, someone impressive to be king. And so a lot of this study is a return back to the dedication of seeking God and his kingdom first, of recommitting ourselves to be faithful to him and to set him up as king in our lives and in our community uh, every single day. And so Peter's going to talk through some of the passages about the coming of the kingdom from the Old Testament and the New Testament, because God starts doing something amazing in history. Amen, Steve. I think it's just exciting to uh, think that even from the, this time in Samuel, God was already preparing uh, his eternal kingdom and bringing us prophesies about it. You know, as I've studied this in the past, to me, this is one of the most impactful things to think about is just how the Bible comes together. And so what we're going to do now is spend some time just digging into what God had to say about the kingdom starting uh, in Isaiah chapter two, if you want to turn there. In verse one, it says, this is what Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains, and it will be exalted above the hills, and all the nations will stream into it. Many people will come and say, come, let us go to the mountains of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. 
He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. You know, it's just exciting to be able to see the, uh, what God has promised there uh, for the future, right? So he's, he's telling us, you know, in the last days, so we'll take a note of that. That's going to come up later. Um, but he, he talks about mountains. And so in the Old Testament, a mountain was a metaphor for a kingdom. <clears throat> so he says here that the, the Lord's kingdom, the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the mountains. All nations will stream into it, and uh, the message will go out from Jerusalem. So that's, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's exciting. It's just, so take note of those things. We'll jot them down, and we'll, we'll turn on over to Daniel chapter 2. And uh, another really foundational passage, just looking at uh, the kingdom of God in uh, Daniel chapter 2, beginning in verse 31. So just to set this up, you know, so uh, Samuel was about 1000 BC. Isaiah was talking in about 750 BC. Daniel now is more like 550 BC. And so at this time, they, they were in the, in the midst of a Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar, you know, has brought Daniel into captivity, but he has had a dream. And so Daniel is going to interpret this dream. And so we sort of jump into that uh, beginning in verse 31, where he starts that. He says, uh, your majesty, you looked, O king, and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron, partly of baked clay. And while you were watching, a rock was cut out, not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were broken to pieces at the same time and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream, and now we will interpret it to you, the king. You, O king, are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands he has placed mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. Wherever they live, he has made you rule over them all. You are the head of gold. You know, it just reminds me when you think of kingdoms of this, of this world, they feel like they're so powerful, like they take on everything. And even here, God through Daniel is saying at this time, Nebuchadnezzar was that head of gold. He seemed like he was, in fact, he was the ruler of everything. But he's, that ruler, like all rulers, doesn't last. So Daniel continues. He says, after you, another kingdom will rise, inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything. <clears throat> and as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. Just as you saw the feet and toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom. Yet it will have some of the strength of iron in it, even as you saw iron mixed with clay. And the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so this kingdom will be partly, a mix, partly strong and partly brittle. And just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united any more than iron mixes with clay. In those times, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it, it's, uh, it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of a mountain, but not by human hands, a rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true, and the interpretation is trustworthy. <clears throat> so the empires that he lays out there, well, Babylonia, we know, is Nebuchadnezzar. That's gold. 
Uh, the Medo-Persian Empire followed him, that's silver. Alexander the Great, after him, bronze. And then sort of the mixed empire that Rome was the iron and the clay. And so a rock was cut out of, out of the, uh, out not by human hands. Well, if you're not by human hands, that's God cutting it out. And that rock is Jesus, right? That rock is the one that's going to uh, crush the worldly kingdoms, but it's been going to become a huge mountain, verse 35, that fills the whole earth. And uh, verse 44, a kingdom that will be never, never be destroyed. So here he's describing, Daniel's describing, describing an, an eternal kingdom that takes over the whole world. Exciting. I like it. Let's turn over to the New Testament. Let's look over at some New Testament predictions of the kingdom, starting in, in uh, Matthew chapter 3 and verse 1. So now we've come forward in time. You know, this is the time of John the Baptist, about AD 25. So um, still a few thousand years ago, but much, much farther along than these than the predictions of Isaiah and Daniel. So here we go in Matthew chapter three and verse one. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the desert of Judea and saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. This is he who was, was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel hair, camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. So here's John the Baptist, you know, in the time of Jesus. So Jesus has been born. So we know that the kingdom didn't come when Jesus was born. We know that it's near, hasn't quite yet come yet. So at the time of John the Baptist, Jesus is alive. The kingdom is not quite there yet. You know, so let's skip over, skip on a little bit to Matthew 4, and uh, we'll start with some of the prophecies of the kingdom that Jesus made. So now we're in Jesus, about AD 30. And so in Matthew 4 and verse 17, Jesus says, From that time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. So still not quite here yet. It's still near. But we're now, so when Jesus began his, his ministry, kingdom is still not here yet. <clears throat> Continuing on over in Mark 9, Mark 9 and verse 1, he talks again. He says, and he said to them, I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God come with power. So two things jump out there. One, the kingdom of God is going to come with power. Now, this is Jesus who walks on water, who raises the dead. Uh, when he says power, um, it's power, right? But then he also says, some of you guys will not taste death. I, I take that to mean that some of you will. And so we expect that some of his disciples are going to die before the kingdom comes with power. So that's another thing we sort of can so we're allude here from what he's saying. Okay, so continuing on, look over in John chapter 3. So we get another interaction between John and a Pharisee here, Nicodemus. And so we'll start in John 3 and verse 1. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He had come to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again. How can a man be born when he's old, Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. I don't know about you, but I'm interested in the passages that talk about entering the kingdom of God. <laughs> so I'm going to make a note here. You know, he's, he's saying that in order for me to get into the kingdom of God, it's got to be by new birth. It's got to be new. And something was not that Nicodemus as a Pharisee is like, what are you talking about? So this was a teaching that even the Pharisee didn't quite understand Jesus, but it was going to be a different thing that got you into the kingdom of, of God, the kingdom of heaven. So it's something to take a note of, to pay attention to as we're looking for the kingdom of heaven. Look over in Luke 17. 
in verse 20. So another thing that's interesting about the kingdom is where it comes from. Because I know that the, uh, the Jews really thought that there was going to be a powerful kingdom come and deliver them by an outside force, right? And yet here, uh, Jesus talks in, in Luke 17, 20. He says, once having been asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, the kingdom of God does not come with your careful observation, nor will people say, here it is, or there it is, because the kingdom of God is within you. And that idea is it's coming inside of you. You know, it's in our terminology, it's going to be a spiritual kingdom. When the kingdom comes, it's not going to be that, that domination, that empire that's taking over, that maybe even sometimes today we wish we had empire that would just knock out all the bad guys. But here Jesus is saying that his kingdom, his eternal kingdom is going to be coming, it's going to be inside of us. It's going to be from within. I'll look over in, uh, in Matthew chapter 16. <clears throat> Keep on going here in verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the son of man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but, my father, but by my father in heaven. <clears throat> and I tell you that you're Peter, and on this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So here we see, we don't quite know at this point what the keys of the kingdom of heaven are. You know, speaking as another guy named Peter, whatever it is, I would love to have the keys of the kingdom of heaven. That seems like it's a good thing. And so uh, just pay attention there. Peter's going to have some active involvement. I think it's interesting, just his name, Rock, reminds me back of what we saw back in the prophecies, right, in uh, Daniel, <clears throat> that there was going to be a rock, right, that uh, was going to destroy the kingdom. That rock uh, is interesting, right? So let's, let's keep an eye there, and let's uh, just keep on going. Let's look over, in, you know, in, in fact, just a note here, I think it's in the study about 1 Corinthians 3. We won't, I won't read it, but it basically says that, um, <clears throat> that the foundation is Jesus Christ. And so really, Jesus Christ is that foundation of God's kingdom. It's exciting. It's really cool. So look over in Luke 23. We'll keep going. So Luke 23 and verse 50, it says, Now there was a man named Joseph, a member of the council, a good and upright man, one who had not consented to their decision and action. He came from the Judean town of Arimathea, and he was waiting for the kingdom of God. So we know Joseph of Arimathea is the one that prepares Jesus' body and buries it in his tomb. And so we know then that at, at the death of Jesus, you know, following his, his persecution, his brutal death on the cross, uh, we know at that point the kingdom had not yet come because Joseph of Arimathea is still waiting uh, for the kingdom, right? So again, just another timeline thing to pay attention to. So Look down now in Luke 24, we'll get a little more here. It says uh, in verse 44, he said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. And he told them, this is what's written. The Christ will suffer and will rise from the dead on the third day and repentance and forgiveness of sins will preach in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my father has promised, but stay here in the city till you've been clothed with power from on high. So we start to see some words. So this is after the resurrection. Jesus is telling them to wait uh, in Jerusalem where it's going to begin and where I'm going to clothe you with power. So hopefully you're starting to see, see you know, some of the patterns of the words that we've been, we've been seeing throughout the study here, uh, starting to, to come up. And then there is, uh, 
I think that's it. So that's the last of the New Testament predictions. So at this point, I'll hand it back over to Steve to start talking about some of the fulfillment. Yeah, we've gone through a lot of information already. So let's just take a deep breath. In through the nose, out through the mouth. <laughs> Get some oxygen in the uh, in the brain. And uh, and so, it, you know, this is a lot of information, but if we can if we can kind of take it in, we can uh, we're going to be we're going to be uh, empowered. OK, OK, stop, Max. Mackenzie's <laughs> settle down. Um, OK, so here's let's, so in review. In review, God in the beginning wanted simply to be our king. He wanted to be our God. And it's a really different kind of organization than we're, than we're used to as humans. But God wanted to be our king. And then he, he wanted to have us be, you know, have, have these roles in his kingdom and in his, in his family where we could use our gifts to serve, where we could flourish, we could thrive. But we rejected that. We rejected it multiple times and wanted a, a worldly king. And we wanted to be like the nations around us. And so we rejected God as our king. We reap the consequences of that. But the awesome thing about it is that God didn't lose his dream for us. He didn't lose his vision for us. He didn't lose, lose his love for us. So God starts, starts communicating these clues. He says, I'm doing something. And we're going to double back around in history. And I am going to set up a kingdom that, uh, that's eternal that's unshakable, that's uh, filled with goodness, that's generous, that's filled with faith and hope and love. And it's going to be led by someone pretty awesome. And we come to know that as, as being led by Jesus himself, by God himself in flesh. So let's go back through the prophecies real quick. We're going to run through the list, and then we're going to go to Acts chapter 2, and we're going to see God fulfilling all of these prophecies specifically right in front of our eyes. And so in Isaiah, we learn it's in the last days. It's going to include all nations. It's, in, uh, it's, in, it's going to start in Jerusalem. And then we look in Daniel chapter 2. Some people think that Daniel's not even true because it's so specific as to the future, uh, the prophecies of the future. And thanks for kind of, you know, kind of making that clear and kind of breaking that down for us, Peter. Um, it talks about it's going to be, a, a, it's going to happen within, within history. And so it gives reference to these other, these other empires that, that rose and fell. It's going to be a rock not cut out by human hands. It becomes a huge mountain that's going to fill the earth. And basically, it's going to be a kingdom that outlasts all the other kingdoms. So in the New Testament, we, we, we're going along in history. And then John the Baptist starts coming and says, the kingdom of heaven is near. And so the, the anticipation is building. We hear from the angels, good news of great joy for all the people. We hear Jesus coming and saying, the kingdom is near. So we learn that the kingdom is going to come in the lifetime of some of the disciples. It's going to come with power. It's going to, uh, you, you enter the kingdom by being born again of water and the spirit. The kingdom is within you. Peter has the keys. He's going to play a special role in this. Um, it says um, that, G that Joseph of Arimathea was still waiting for the kingdom when Jesus died. And so we know it hadn't come quite yet. And then repentance and forgiveness of sins are going to be preached uh, first of all in Jerusalem. And then they're going to be preached to all nations beginning oh. in Jerusalem. Acts chapter two, let's turn over there. I'm Acts chapter one. So we see in Acts chapter one that Jesus uh, rises from the dead. He uh, spends time with his apostles. And he basically commissions them to, to go forth. He says, but you're going to receive power in verse 8 when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and, to the end, and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so Jesus sends these guys. He says, and it's, it's, it's this team that he's, that he's prepared for this moment. This team of regular people. This team of regular, regular men and women. And so they meet in Jerusalem and they're just spending time. Uh, uh, it says, it says in verse 14, they all joined together constantly in prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and with his brothers. And, uh, and so they're forming this community and they're preparing themselves for something that's been promised that's about to come. And so in Acts chapter two, we read in verse one, it says, when the day of Pentecost came, 
the special feast, which is basically a feast of, of, of the harvest because of the seeds that have been planted and have fallen to the ground and died uh, 50 days before. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly the sound of a blowing, like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard the sound, a crowd came together. And so they're hanging out in Jerusalem, and something epic happens. There's this blowing of, like the blowing of a violent wind. It's the Holy Spirit. It comes to rest on the apostles, and so they're able to speak in all these other languages, and they stand up to speak and to praise God and declare the glory of God in all these different tongues. And the people were, 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 were blown away. And, uh, and so we start to see the fulfilling of all these prophecies specifically. And so if you look down in that, in that number three, it's fulfillment of the Old and New Testament predictions in Acts chapter one and two. In the last days, as it talks about in Isaiah, all nations, as it talks about in Isaiah in Luke 24, in Jerusalem, as it talks about in Isaiah in Luke chapter 24, it's an eternal kingdom that uh, talks about in, in Daniel. Uh, the, the date is uh, approximately 33 AD. It's the time of that fourth kingdom, the kingdom that would be divided, partly iron and partly clay. It's during that time. John the Baptist said it was near. Jesus said it was near. It's in the lifetime of the apostles. And so some of them stood up, but we know that, that Judas is no longer there. And so it's within the lifetime of the apostles as predicted in Mark chapter nine, verses one. It comes with power. It talks about in Mark chapter 9, verse, verse 1. And, and we see that Peter stands up in verse 14, and Peter stood up with the 11, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only 9 in the morning. No, this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit in all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs in the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. Men of Israel, listen to this. And then he says, Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. And he starts preaching about who? About Jesus. Guys, the kingdom of God is a Jesus-led kingdom. He is our leader. He is the head. He is our great conqueror who conquered even death. And that's what Peter talks about here in Acts chapter 2. He stands up, and the first part of the good news is Jesus. Guys, we need light in humanity. We need Christ. We need some hope. We need, we need some inspiration. We need some light in all this darkness. And that's what Jesus brings. Not even death could hold him down. Jesus is so far superior to any other king, to any other human leader, to any other, to any other hero or victorious uh, conqueror. Jesus is far superior, and we get to follow him. And Peter, as one of his best friends, stands up and says, hey, let me tell you about this guy. I live with him for three straight years. He's awesome. He's worthy to be followed. Guys, he even rose from the dead. Not even David did that. And he talks about how David called Jesus Lord and looked forward to his Lord. So, so, so he talks about his death and his burial and his resurrection. And in verse 36 says, therefore, let all Israel be assured this God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. We rejected God even in the flesh. We rejected God even in the flesh. We crucified him. We betrayed him. We ran away when times got tough. And yet God is still coming back to us with his grace and with his love and with a second chance. And he said, what shall we do? And Peter could have easily said, there's nothing you can do. God is no longer for you. 
God is against you. In fact, God is going to destroy all of us because of what we've done to him and how we've rejected him. But he doesn't say that. He gives us opportunity for new birth into a whole new life that we can die to all the junk and all the stuff and all the worldliness that doesn't lead anywhere except for despair. And we can start a whole new life. We can be born again into the kingdom of light. It says, when the people heard this in verse 37, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Listen to this, the promise, the promise. This isn't a condemnation. This isn't a punishment. This is a promise that's being fulfilled. And all of these things that we've talked about over thousands of years are coming true in God's benevolence, in God's love for us, and in God's grace. And so we see God's power is predicted in Mark 9 and so many other places. We see the idea of new birth into a living hope. We see the idea of a kingdom within that we're going to receive the Holy Spirit, God with us. A kingdom within, it's, 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 it's in us, it's among us. It's not a kingdom, it's not a worldly kingdom with territory and boundaries. It's going to fill the whole earth. Peter had the keys to the kingdom because they asked Peter, what shall we do? He said, hey, I've got, I've got the keys here. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. And then repentance and forgiveness of sins. God calls us to repent, guys, of our worldly ways of the stuff that's just not working anyway. He calls us to repent of our sins and to be baptized into Christ. And from so many other passages in the scriptures, we know that that to be a death, that we die with Christ and then we're raised to a whole new life just as Jesus rose from the dead and gives us resurrection in our life. So we see here in Acts chapter two that 3,000 were baptized that day. Now listen to this, verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and to the fellowship, and to the breaking of bread. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God, and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Thank God. For the kingdom of his son. Jesus, reconciliation with the king and community, light and life and love. It's what God had intended for us all along. Let's embrace it. Peter's going to say a few things. I think it's <clears throat> the passage here where they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayer just reminds me of going back where you started, Steve, back in, in Genesis, right? Where in the Garden of Eden, that's really what God wanted us. He wanted us to be devoted uh, to him. You know, he wanted us to be devoted mm -hmm. to his word. He wanted us to be devoted to him in, in prayer and worship. He wanted us to be devoted to each other in fellowship. It's just uh, exciting that, uh, that in the kingdom now, we get reunited with what God ultimately wanted for us. You know, Paul says in Ephesians 1, he says that we were, we were chosen, we were marked with the Holy Spirit, we were included in Christ, and it's not just for the future, it was for the present age mm -hmm. and the age to come. And I think that's the exciting thing to think about the kingdom, is that the kingdom is not something that's way off in the future, but the kingdom right now, as, as, as Acts writes here, that uh, this is the time that we get to devote ourselves to being kingdom people, to being people that devote ourselves to understanding the word of God and to following it, mm -hmm. to uh, loving each other. I know in, in COVID, we've had to develop some new ideas about fellowship, but I believe God uses that to help us to take it deeper. <clears throat> you know, praying for other people is more important now. Considering others more highly than yourself is more important now. Uh, we, you know, Finding ways to have fellowship when it's not so easy is, is, is going to make us even more God's people at this point in time. I think it's just, to me, it's just very encouraging to get to dig in and think about God's kingdom, to think about how it really was 
fulfilled, not just in the first century, but it was fulfilled for each one of us when we were added to his kingdom. And it's continues to be fulfilled as we devote ourselves to being his people. You know, if you read on there, it says all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. As if 3,000 people added the day before were not enough, they continued to have an impact on the world around them <clears throat> they, uh, they, by praising God and really just having an impact on the people around them because they were being like Jesus. The kingdom really had changed them. And, uh, you know, I believe it's, it has changed us and is going to continue to change us as we commit ourselves to <clears throat> living out the kingdom life. Thanks, Peter. <clears throat> Just two more passages before we share a very special moment together, and that's sharing the communion, because we're thinking about Jesus's body, <clears throat> thinking about Jesus's blood that paid the price so that we could, we could inherit the kingdom. Amazing. Guys, we get to live the good life. We get to live under a king who's not going to take from us, but who wants to provide for us. We get to live in a kingdom of protection eternal protection and provision and plenty. You know, it's not the world we live in, but it's the world we can live in if we, if we can make a one basic choice in our life. You know, it talks about that here in Matthew chapter six. It's amazing how humanity hasn't really changed. You know, Jesus talks about here in Matthew chapter six, and starting verse 25, about, about the worry and the anxiety that comes with life. He talks about a society of people that would constantly be chasing after the wind, chasing after popularity, chasing after worldly wealth, chasing after all the things that the world promises, when the whole time God wants to give us those things. He wants to be generous with those things because he's our father and he promises those things. You know, guys, we live in the age of anxiety. We live in the age where anxiety is more rampant than it's ever been before. And in the midst of that anxiety that seems to be pulling us, literally pulling us apart, where we're becoming disintegrated, where there's so little health to be found around the world and in, in the worldly solutions, we need to listen to what Jesus is saying right here. When he says in verse 32, he says, for the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly father knows that you need them. Verse 33, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And listen to this promise. And all these things will be given to you as well. God is not trying to take from us like the worldly kings and the worldly rulers. God wants to give to us. There's one decision that we need to make every single day. And that's simply the decision to seek first God, to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And even that word righteousness is a relational word. It's doing the right thing in relationship to someone that we're devoted to. So we can have righteousness as it, as it, as it uh, pertains to our friends. We can have righteousness as it pertains to our spouse. But we can also have righteousness in terms to God. It's that idea of fidelity. It's that idea of faithfulness and devotion. They devoted themselves to, to God and the kingdom ways. He says, but seek first his kingdom. Make it the first priority of your life. Make it the absolute number one priority of your day. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. Guys, guys, got us. Guys, God's got our past, he's got our present, he's got our future. Don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Live each, uh, he says, each day has enough trouble of its own. Guys, I want to call us back to this basic decision. And it's this decision to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Let's reject the, <clears throat> the offering of the worldly kingdoms in our life. 
yeah, we've got to live in the world, but we need, don't need to be of the world. We have an alternative. It's an alternative where we get to live and walk with a benevolent king, a benevolent provider who can provide us and come through on all of his promises. And he, and he will, and he does. You know, I was talking with the guys out at the bonfire last week about where power comes from. And I was talking about walking with God from Joshua chapter one. Guys, it's so easy to meditate on all the headlines, on all the bad news. You know, it's so easy to meditate on all our failures and all the ways that we don't, we don't measure up. But that's not what God t- t- says to, to Joshua or to anybody before or since. He says, walk with me. Devote yourself to me. I'll give you everything you need. I got everything taken care of. I, there's, there's, no, there's nothing that God doesn't have that he doesn't want to give to us in his love and his generosity. Look over in Colossians chapter one. We're going to, we're going to close out on this, um, this thought. Colossians chapter one. Guys, I want us to think about that basic choice in our lives uh, as we take time for communion. Jesus made a choice that he gave everything for us. He gave his blood for us gave his body for us and it was really just a plea and it was really just a plea for us to repent and to and to and get clear about God's faithfulness but it was also a a, an act of love for us I love you this much and I want a relationship with you this much and I want to dwell with you and walk with you and be in relationship with you into eternity this much And I really want to ask us to rededicate ourselves to this basic pledge that we're going to seek first God. That's going to be the distinguishing mark of who we are as a community, as individuals, in our families, is that we love God with all our heart, all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our body. That's, That's our first priority. And the world may not understand it. The world may not get it. But that's who we are. And we love it. And God is so faithful to his promises. In Colossians chapter 1, he talks about the kingdom. In verse 13, he says, For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, where the thrones were powers, rules, or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. And it goes on just to talk about the incredible privilege and honor it is to have him and to be in his kingdom. Let's pray and let's celebrate the forgiveness, the redemption of our lives and the forgiveness of our sins. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we can't believe it. We're amazed, we're blown away that you love us so much that you gave us so much and you continue to give us so much. God, we want to pledge to you our whole lives, every thought, every emotion, every, every, every attitude, every sense of our soul and spirit. Father, every act of our body, we want, Father, we want to dedicate it to you and entrust it to you, Father, because we know that you are faithful. Thank you for, for working. God, in, in, God, in, despite our rebellion, and despite our rejection of you, Father, thanks for working on our behalf through Christ. It's that that we celebrate now by taking the bread and the juice. We love you, God, and we look forward just to a few moments of really meditating on, on Jesus, and it's in his name we pray. Amen.